covered and mostly empty. So were the next pair, and the next. I saw a total of 12 disused classrooms in that hallway, and a small break room complete with a lonely coffee pot. I also found two small restrooms. I didn't spend much time checking them out, as the lights didn't work and I didn't feel like replacing those bulbs. I found myself getting slightly nervous. I was in a strange section of the campus, and I was working alone that night. In the back of my mind, I just couldn't truly justify the existence, the waste, of a whole floor full of unused classrooms. When I got to the end of the hallway, I met another steel door. I opened it and saw another stairwell. I was fully expecting this stairwell to go up to connect to one of the other main stairwells in Downing Hall. The stairs went only down. This was the point, I remember, at which I began to get scared. No way. There's no way these stairs go down. How would anybody get down here? The stairwell echoed at me. I should have checked the time. I should have been concerned with finishing my rounds. I should have been hungry for lunch. I should have run. I started to climb down the stairs. This stairwell was unlit and appeared to be much older and in much worse condition than the others. It was also longer, much longer. After a few minutes of walking down the steps, I began to count them. At every twelve steps there was a small landing, a turn and another set of steps, down. After ten landings I reached another door. It was unlocked and opened easily. The hinges squealed and the echoes died like lost things in the dark. I groped against the left wall for a light switch and there was none. I checked the right and the wall was equally smooth. I cast the flashlight around but saw nothing. Nothing forward, nothing to either side and nothing above. I snapped my fingers listening for the echo. I may or may not have heard one. I slowly came to realize that the room into which I had entered was enormous, cavernous, possibly the biggest room I had ever physically experienced. I shrank back to the doorway for a moment. This room can't be here, I said to myself. I started to think about going back, but I also started to think about wanting to know what was in there. I took a step forward and another, until I was walking steadily into the room. I kept a steady pace, counting my steps. I looked over my shoulder every few yards, using the light from the open doorway to orient myself. I walked, slowly, for a hundred yards, two hundred yards, until I saw a dim glow ahead. The glow got faintly brighter and larger as I walked toward it. Another hundred yards, and another, and three more passed until I could make out a small, dim light bulb near a door. That door was of a different type entirely. It was huge, fourteen feet tall at least, and half again as wide. The surface was a black metal, studded with rivets and bolts, mounted on huge hinges. Across the face of the door, graved into the metal, were words with some strange looping script that I could not recognize. Every surface was carved with that script, or with strange diagrams made of splayed circle-ended lines. In the center of the door was a large spoked wheel lock, and in the center of the lock was a tiny keyhole. Above the keyhole was a sigil, enclosed in three circles. I looked behind me, and could not see the light from the stairwell. I couldn't see anything at all. I held the superhero keychain to the dim light and flipped through the keys. Of course, there was only one small battered key that looked as if it might fit. I inserted it into the lock and turned it. I heard a click and a thud and a sound from within the door like pouring pebbles or dry teeth. I pulled the key from the lock and grasped the spokes of the wheel lock. My heart was racing and sweat was dribbling into my eyes. I turned the spokes to the left, counterclockwise, Wittershins, some buried memory in my head said, 
and kept turning until the wheel stopped. There was another thud and a crack, and then silence. The darkness behind me no longer felt empty. In fact, it felt positively crowded as if I had an audience watching me. I stepped back from the door and flashed my light around. Still nothing. Dry, empty floor. I turned back to the door, grasped the large cast iron handles and pulled. Nothing. I tried harder putting all my weight into the pole, and at the last moment, at the end of my strength, I heard another crack, and the door groaned open on a draft of cool, stinking air. The smell was heavy, moist, and musky. I had a flash memory of my mother taking me to the zoo as a child, and the smell of the cat house with the lions. At the thought of the lions, I let go of the handles and stumbled back a bit. I carefully shone my light into the yawning black crevice of the open door. I saw a short hallway that opened into a small, cramped room. I saw a filthy, rusted metal chair. I saw bones. Small bones. I saw, or heard, or smelled a form so black it seemed to suck in the light of my flashlight. I saw a black form rushing towards me, running towards me, filling the hallway, howling and laughing and speaking in a voice that sounded like mountains collapsing. I remember fangs and words that turned my bones to rusted glass. I remember feathers and a hand with too many fingers jeweled with something unspeakable and the smell, the stink of something long caged. I remember wings. I don't know how long I wandered in the dark, alone under hundreds of feet of rock. There was no light. There was no way to judge time. My flashlight was dead, and my cell phone, and even small specks of luminescent paint on my cheap wristwatch were dark. There was something wrong with my right leg. It hurt, but I couldn't see enough to find out why. I kept hearing my audience there in that cavernous room. I screamed at them. I felt one of them touch my face and I threw my flashlight at it. The flashlight bounced and rattled and became still somewhere that I was not. Something laughed later. I raved and screamed but didn't throw anything else. I found the doorway after hours or days of crawling. There were no lights in the stairwell. After years of climbing, I crawled into that first forgotten hallway. I sliced my fingers on the crushed remains of the light bulb I had packed in my satchel. I crawled down the hallway and reached the next stairwell. I hauled myself up them and finally out into the boiler room. When I staggered out of Downing Hall two full days after going in, It was into dim winter daylight and a full police presence. Five people had been found dead on and around the campus. All had been brutally, savagely murdered, bodies splayed open, viscera missing. The teeth marks suggested a wild animal, but the murder scenes and body positioning also displayed a certain intelligence to them. There was also the writings, carved into the flesh when it was not yet dead meat. The cops wouldn't talk about the writing. The cops wouldn't talk to me either. Not afterwards. When they first saw me stumble out into the daylight, covered in blood, they assumed I was the perpetrator. They quickly changed their assumptions when the medics pointed out the green stick fracture, the dehydration, the concussion, and the obvious shock. The cops asked a lot of questions, and I answered as best as I could. I told them about the door in the boiler room. They couldn't find it. They showed me the bare, smooth wall from where I had crawled, dazed and broken. My tracks stopped at that wall. Two cops tried breaking through the wall into that spot, only to meet old brick and older earth past that. 
The cops wanted to know where the long black feathers came from, stuck to my clothes by dried blood. I didn't know. I didn't want to know. The cops, the medics, nobody would look at me anymore. The scars on my face, the deep, gouged out writing, was not a sight that most would want to see. I was marked. Whatever I had let out, whatever had killed and eaten five people, and a week later six more, had marked me as a friend.